Hi Liz, how are you? I'm very well, thank you Claire, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Good. And thank you for spending the time to talk to us. We it's really my do. absolute pleasure. Thank, uh, thank you. Um, well, some of our British viewers might might know, might know you from BBC Bango's The Theory and Stargazing, Stargazing Live, but do you have any standout moments from your TV career? Um, I'm very lucky that I do what I absolutely love and so when I'm sent to do anything to do with science or natural history it's pretty much a standout moment for me it's like a bit of a dream yeah. come true I learn so much and I meet such um, such inspiring people you know um, but I have to say well for because you mentioned stargazing last year they sent me to Norway to, on a on a on the hunt for the aurora the northern yeah, light remember that, yeah. and it was a little bit of an ambitious uh, project because they wanted us to capture the aurora live from a plane. So you can imagine the technology that was necessary, never mind us yeah, exactly. needing an incredible amount of luck to do it in the couple of minutes we, were, we would be on air and then we'd yeah, go back yeah. to the studio. But we achieved it, and I also got to see the most ridiculous auroral display. So that definitely sticks out in my memory. I can see that. But I think um, as well I've been very lucky to combine my biochemistry background with my wild animal biology background and uh, do a lot of programs on the the intelligence of animals the behaviors of animals which I'm really fascinated okay. about and because of those shows I've I've uh, encountered gray whales in Mexico that come up to the boat and present their calves and they play around the boat and like to be scratched which is really really surreal because of all the cetaceans they're the most primordial looking they're very unusual and that was a very powerful moment. And I've encountered elephants and tigers. And oh, I've just been really lucky, Claire. So it's very difficult to pick one. But because I studied tigers for my master's, um, being able to film a program about Siberian tigers or the Amur tiger in the Russian Far East was yeah. definitely up there in one of my like dream come true moments. And I feel very privileged to have been able to do that with the BBC. You know, that was that was definitely a... a, a a gold star moment for me anyway <laughs> and have you got any t um, tv program or documentary that you haven't filmed yet but you'd really like to i've loads <laughs> there's a massive long list that i keep on pestering people at the bbc about um yeah i mean i i'd like to continue uh, discovering this wonderful planet of ours but i think next on my list i would love to do something um with the um snow leopards uh, i'm a little bit obsessed um they are obviously very, very difficult to film um and very difficult to uh, reach and study um so for me you don't necessarily have to have the animal on camera all the time you can tell its story yeah. through the that research these animals which is very much what we did for um, Operation Snow Tiger so I would love there's lots of fantastic projects going on at the moment including a, a, a long-term five-year project uh, studying the, the snow leopard so I'd love to do a, a, a you know a series on that and the, and the scientists that work uh, you know at studying this big cat I can that sounds amazing <laughs> <laughs> well it's it, I'm not doing it or anything there's no commission or anything but hopefully fingers crossed in the future I might get a chance to do that well just fingers crossed <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, what is it and um, if you don't mind me asking what did you do before tv um before television I well I went to university I studied biochemistry I sang in a band for a while I traveled a lot um and kind of floated through the, through through a lot of my 20s not not being sort of too serious about you know getting my career together and I, I didn't you know I, I wasn't I wasn't at pains to figure it all out very early and it's something that I kind of like to advise people about when they ask me about either a science career or a television career you know that you don't have to stress yourself out too much with with knowing exactly what you want to do um things tend to fall into place as long as you've got something that yeah. you're passionate about and you eventually discover that in some way so yeah i uh, did my biochemistry as i as i say and then uh went back to do a master's many years later actually here in london you know oh, yeah. um, in wild animal biology so yeah studied traveled sang a bit and then got into tv <laughs>
<laughs> sounds good. Um, have you got um, something that's like your best thing about your job? The best thing about my job is um, being inspired by all these fantastic people I meet. Um, for example, there was a fantastic guy called Viktor Lukareski, who's a Russian scientist who is obsessed with tigers and leopards and is the, one of the most passionate, generous, kind, intelligent, warm, just a, a, just a good guy, a good egg, you know, a good human being um, that I've ever met. And um, as well as just selfishly loving my experiences in television because I get to travel and learn things and see things, what it's taught me above all is that there are some really, really fantastic individuals on this planet that are, to me, the unsung heroes of the world who really just dedicate their lives to protecting our natural world. And it's been a lovely uh, eye opener for me to know that there are these incredible people out there who yeah, yeah. do that kind of stuff. So that's been lovely. That puts a smile on my face and makes me think we might just be okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, um, is there only one past or present that you admire most in the world of science? But I suppose you've kind of, you said one person well yeah I've mentioned Victor and you know of course there's the Charles Darwin's and the Marie Curie's and um the Isaac Newton's all these incredible groundbreaking geniuses who really just changed the world for the better in ways that we can only dream about um but for me it's about the people on the ground the scientists who are not have not become world famous not for lack of of all their hard work and their their furthering of uh, you know so the scientific um our scientific knowledge um but who are you know nonetheless just as important um and victor is certainly one of those people but also what comes to mind is um do you remember when there was the big bp oil spill in the gulf of mexico oh, yeah, yeah. um we went to do a piece on that uh, for Bango's A Theory and in one big hangar in incredibly humid, um, very, very hot temperatures, all these scientists were working tirelessly night and day to save all these birds that had been um, affected by the oil spill, all these pelicans. And they were there was this massive sort of factory line of a group that was washing them, a, a group that was warming them up, a group that was feeding them. And we were just there filming and they were just getting on with it. And I had a moment of just like, yeah, I had to take stock of these incredible people doing this work with no recognition. You know, they are to me, you know, the, sci the scientists that we should admire the most. I totally agree. Yeah. Um, for, for, I know you're supporting the antibacterial resistance for the Longitude Prize, but what do you think the next major scientific milestone or discovery is going to be? I mean, that's a very good question. There are so many areas that need attention. Um, I don't, it's impossible to predict what the next milestone will, will be because by the very nature of, of, you know, how science works, everything is, uh, you know, a progress from the last bit of research, from the last project, from the last study, from the last research paper. So who knows who's going to have uh, a groundbreaking moment that will fast track that particular area. But what I think is interesting is how more so than ever all the different scientific disciplines are communicating with each other more and yeah. what I'm excited about is this thing called open source which quite a few scientists are doing where the focus isn't on economic gain the focus is on bettering our planet um, for the future and that means sharing your ideas with other scientists so that the progress of that idea is fast-tracked mm -hmm. And when it comes to sustainability issues on our planet, that's what a lot of young scientists are doing. And it's, it's so yeah. refreshing in so many ways. And I think there's a massive lesson to be learned about not focusing on how much money you can make, but focusing on, oh, you know, doing, doing what we're all supposed to be doing, protecting our planet for the future. So that, that's where I'm really excited about with respect to what's coming next in science. The more the different disciplines talk to each other, the, the, more, the more exciting scientific discoveries are going to become. Um, I really, I'd, in the future, I'd really love to become a science TV presenter. But would you really? Oh. I would. <laughs> are you sure? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I wouldn't warn you away. I'm kidding. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard job, too. People think that it's, you know, I mean, obviously, I'm very lucky and I get to travel. But it's, it's a, it, you know, it's a tough job as well. <laughs> 
Well, I think I think that's part of what kind of attracts attracts me to it. The sort of challenge behind it. That's good. That's good. You know, You're halfway there, then, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> and I think with the blogging as well, it's um, I've tried to get as much experience as I can. Good on you. Good on you. Kind of How old are you, Claire? And I'm 16. Ah, you're only a baby. <laughs> <laughs> but fair play to you. Do, do you need any advice or what were you going to ask me? Well, I was going to, I was going to ask if you've got um, advice for anyone who wants to go into science or science communication. Yeah, science communication um, is not just uh, television presenting. I think yeah, what's cool. been lovely for me is to understand, you know, how much I can do aside from just the presenting aspects. So we do a lot of talks and we get together at the Cheltenham Science Festival, the Big Bang Fair. Um, so yeah, it's about science communication. Um, and if you're into that, I think first and foremost, you just have to be, be passionate about it for the right reasons, you know, um, yeah. that you want to be part of a movement that helps to inspire the next generation. Um, because sometimes when it comes to television, some people might be attracted to it just because they'd like to be on television. So I think people who do well in science communication are not so much great presenters. They're people who really know their stuff and really care about it. And once that passion comes through, everything else can follow. You know, you don't have to be the most well-versed presenter or with the best voice for voiceovers, but you, you know, you need to... You need to have that passion coming yeah. out and, and that's the way to inspire others and, and to really make an impression on others with respect to, you know, issues about the natural world or the, yeah. all the wonders of the natural world. So I think it's about, it's about hard work and dedication, like everything else in this world, you know, that you, you might want to do, but passion above all else is what will get you through. Well, thanks. I think the thing for me is that the science TV presenting is um, it's like science communication on the kind of one of the biggest sort of scales where the one that everyone everyone sees. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so, yes. Yeah, so you do reach um, a big audience through television. But, you know, the world is changing. I mean, we're experiencing that when we're talking about the future of programming people don't watch as much telly in the same way as they used to in the past. And that's why it's important. You know, you've got a blog, you're doing this online. There's a lot of other ways to communicate science. And actually you don't reach as big an audience on television as you used to. Um, yeah. And so we're very aware of that, about other ways to, to, to reach the people you want to reach, to, to communicate a certain you know aspect of, of science or the natural world or whatever. Um, and that's why for me, sometimes I think, you know, I've traveled so much in a year that I haven't been around to actually meet people and give talks to schools and all that kind of stuff. I think that's really important as well, you know. Exactly. Have you, um, to, on the subject of science programming, I know that Bangor's theory isn't returning, but do you think there's not, not enough um, public interest for long running? programs and only sort of one-off specials like stargazing like well it's a series but yeah um no i think you know bang has been on air for almost six years we yeah, yeah. i think we did well how many eight series or more nine series so what? you know like everything else there's very few um formats that sort of last forever um especially yeah. in the changing world of television at the moment and how science changes so much. Um, the BBC just decided, okay, time to maybe stop that, but they're, they're replacing it with other science programs that will go on air at the same time on BBC One. So we're very much um, committed to producing programs for BBC One, for BBC One audience, as well as, you know, the Horizons and everything else we do on BBC Two and BBC Four. It was just time to look at another way of communicating aspects of science for that audience do you know so okay. it wasn't a reflection on the public's uh, uh, reception of it because the ratings were just as good as they had ever been it was just a decision to sort of change the format and just put out something new really so thankfully it's really good to see that you know we're still committed to putting out th those kind of programs on bbc one in the future and they're working on two of them at the moment already so it's all good Apart from obviously making science fun, do you think there's a way of dispelling the myths and promoting science in schools to um, get the next generation of young scientists? 
Yeah, I think there's, you know, the, 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 it's, it's a difficult one because for me it just comes so naturally, it makes so much sense that science by its very nature doesn't really need to have to be sold because it's just so cool, you know, it's just, it's just yeah, describing, yeah. it's describing the world around you. And what's interesting is sometimes when you do, when you are privy to some discussions about, you know, oh, science is this, it's that, it's a, it's an old man in, in a lab coat and it's, you know, there's no creativity attached to it. I don't know where that stemmed from, but it's really and truly not the case and never has been the case with respect to science. I mean, most scientists I know, I know are, one of my best friends is now in Antarctica chasing penguins and putting up like these monitoring cameras and having the most incredible time of his life, you know, where we are a bunch of very creative, um, very positive, uh, adventure-seeking people for the most part. Um, and so, you know, like everything else, our culture and, and popular, popular media tends to sort of characterize different uh, careers as certain things that aren't necessarily true. Anyway, having said all of that, I think our role as science communicators is just to remind people that science is about describing this incredible planet of ours and beyond and... I think once you just remind them of that and reignite their curiosity for the world, the rest does the job because I think people make the mistake of thinking science is a is a subject and it's a thing. It's like law or it's like, I don't know, you know, and for me, it's not. For me, it's just science is about asking questions about why you're here. How does your body work? What does that plant do? What's that? What's how far is that star from from our planet? You know, that that to me is science. So it's almost like reminding people what they were like when they were children and they couldn't yeah. stop asking questions and they were so excited about the world that's what scientists are <laughs> and that's yeah. what us as science communicators are trying to do is remind them of their childish enthusiasm and curiosity about the world that's that sounds really good <laughs> um uh, what have you got like an early science memory so anything that you did as a kid or yeah, I, I, it's only when people started asking me this, obviously, that, that when I was in this career that I had to kind of a think about it. But I do remember I grew up in the south of France in the countryside where we had a little wood by our house. And so there was often a, a, um, all these really cool birds that would land on my little balcony outside my bedroom. And I remember staring at these little birds and looking at their eyes moving in their sockets and imagining their tiny hearts beating in their little fluffy chests and wondering how on earth something so small could work so perfectly um, when it would move its head or cock its head towards me. I remember thinking, what is it thinking? How is, how, you know, it, it, it's just such, nature is so perfect. I, I wanted to understand how on earth it could be so perfect and so, so awesome, you know, um, so that's my earliest memories and I think that's why I studied biochemistry because I always wanted to know how everything works down to chemical equations basically no, that's, I, th I think that's it but thank you so much for your time my absolute pleasure Claire